Jackie was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 64. The illness spread rapidly, and Jackie opted to die at home. Her son John called her sister Lee to inform her Jackie had only a few hours to live. Lee rushed to her sister's side. The two sisters were left alone to talk, and they shared a final moment, as close as they had been in their youth. The rumors of Lee having an affair with John, or Jackie, stealing Onassis from Lee, and all the tragedies, jealousies and betrayals had driven them apart. But in those final moments, they spoke of their childhood, of their father, of the time when they had not only been sisters, but best friends. Jackie died on May 19, 1994, ironically on her father's birthday. Lee wept, but when the will was read, Lee was completely left out. Her last words to her sister written in the will, I have made no provision for my sister Lee Radziwill, with whom I have great affection, because I have already done so in my life. Lee was deeply hurt, publicly humiliated. How could two sisters who had shared so much end up like this? Today, we look at the story of Jackie Kennedy Onassis and her sister Lee Radziwill. Jackie and Lee Bouvier were the only children of John Bouvier and Janet Lee. Jackie was born in 1929, and her sister Caroline Lee Bouvier was born four years later. Jackie was named after her father, and to all accounts, she was his favorite. She looked like him, and was even named after him, Lee said later. The name Bouvier came from the French word meaning beef, as Jack Bouvier, nicknamed Black Jack, had come from a family of French cattle herders. Lee took on her mother's maiden name. Her mother would tell everyone that she was a descendant of Robert E. Lee and that she had come from a family of Southern aristocrats, when in fact, she was descended from Irish immigrants, much as the Kennedys were. Lee, on the other hand, was the favorite of their mother, who would often praise her and criticize her just as harshly. However, when the girls were young, their parents got divorced. Jack was a well-known womanizer and gambler, but after the Wall Street crash and some bad investments, he fell on hard times and Janet remarried to Hugh Dudley Auchinclaus, who was 10 years older and a man of considerable wealth. Hugh D, as he was called, was also the stepfather of Gore Vidal through another marriage. Gore described their relationship as one of S and M, with Jackie doing the S and Lee doing the M. But after the divorce, the sisters felt like outsiders in the household and grew incredibly close. Jackie was an outstanding student and an avid reader. Lee, who was less accomplished in school, was more outgoing and participated in school plays, landing lead roles. Life magazine dedicated an entire page to Lee's coming out. At a young age, Lee had been pudgier than Jackie, and who, though she was careful to never be photographed with a cigarette, advised her sister to smoke to help lose weight. Jackie herself was a two-pack-a-day smoker most of her life. Lee was their mother's favorite. Janet always criticized Jackie for her hair and appearance. Lee believed it was because of her resemblance to her father. In 1951, when Lee was 18 and Jackie was 22, they were allowed to spend the summer traveling around Europe. Jackie had won Vogue's essay contest and was to be given a job working at Vogue as an editor, but her mother worried that at 22, Jackie should be focusing on marriage, not work. So forced her to decline the award and the trip around Europe was their consolation. Both Jackie and Lee spoke French fluently and had a great interest in the arts. They would call each other Peaks and Jacks affectionately. Lee kept a scrapbook of those times with her writing the entries and Jackie adding drawings and poems. This would be published 50 years later in a book titled One Special Summer. The two sisters enchanted everyone they met and were best friends spending all day in cafes or walking and evenings at parties, getting in various predicaments where they would cover for each other. Hudi, through his connections, had the sisters meeting diplomats, heads of state and royalty. This was by all accounts the time in their life when they were the closest. The two sisters would not travel together again for 12 years when Jackie was first lady of the United States. Upon returning to America, Jackie became an inquiring camera girl for the Washington Times Herald. In her role, she would walk up to people on the street, take photographs, and ask them questions such as, which famous person's death impacted you the most? Do the rich enjoy life more than the poor? Do you think a wife should let her husband think he is smarter than she is? 
would you support a woman for president of the United States? She was even able to get into the Republican convention after Eisenhower and Nixon's win, interviewing Pat, Nixon's wife. After pressure from her mother, she finally got engaged with a Wall Street stockbroker. John G. W. Husted Jr., a friend of her stepfather in 1952, the engagement did not last long, and the relationship soon ended. Lee continued to pursue her dream of being a singer and spent the next summer in Rome taking singing lessons. Her first job was as a special assistant at Harper's Bazaar. At 20 years old, she beat Jackie to the altar and married Michael Canfield, whom she had known and occasionally dated since she was 15. He was seven years older. There were rumors that he was the illegitimate son of Prince George, to whom he bore a striking resemblance. The rumors persist to this day, as he was adopted by the American publisher Cass Canfield. Though Canfield was by no means poor, he was not fabulously wealthy. Hugh D. had misgivings about the marriage and remarked to a friend, he will never be able to afford her. At the wedding, Jackie caught the bridal bouquet, and just three months later, her engagement to the most eligible bachelor in the United States, the Massachusetts Senator John Kennedy, was announced. Jack Kennedy was struck by Jackie's intelligence and beauty, and she would ask him questions as the inquiring camera girl such as, do you agree the Irish are deficient in the area of love? And if you went out on a date with Marilyn Monroe, what would you talk about? The wedding was September 12, 1953, at Hammersmith Farm. Her father, Black Jack, who had once been so handsome, he was often mistaken for Clark Gable in public, was greatly diminished by this time. He was too drunk to walk his favorite daughter down the aisle, and the role fell to her stepfather. In 1955, Jackie suffered a miscarriage. Two years later, she gave birth to a daughter named Arabella, but the child was still born. On August 3rd, 1957, Blackjack Bouvier passed away from cancer. He had always doted on his daughters, taking them to racetracks, operas, casinos, and plays, and inspired in Jackie a love of horse riding that she never lost. Lee, on the other hand, was less keen after several falls in her youth which had left her with a broken nose and a chipped tooth. He left most of what he had to Jackie and Lee, which amounted to $80,000 each. About this time, Lee began an affair with the man she would later marry, Stas Radziwill. He was from a family of the nobility and a Polish prince. Though he had been forced to give up his title when becoming a British citizen, both he and Lee would use it and be referred to by those monikers. Even after her divorce from Stas many years later, she would still insist on being called by her title. In 1959, their first son, Anthony, was born. It was a difficult pregnancy, and he was born three months premature, but grew robust and healthy. Just six months later, she was pregnant again, and again she delivered three months early. Their daughter, Anna, was born almost exactly one year after she had given birth to their son. At this time, Lee grew angry at Staz. She was suffering severe postpartum depression and began locking her bedroom door and the sexual part of their marriage all but ended. Staz began seeking affection elsewhere, as did Lee, who several years later began an affair with the bisexual ballet dancer Rudolf Nureyev. Since his defection to the West, he was viewed as a rock star and Lee was fascinated by him. However, it was Jackie who had met him first. After seeing him dance at Carnegie Hall with Grace Kelly also in attendance, she invited him to the White House and a 30-year friendship ensued. Lee and Stas threw a lavish party for him on his 28th birthday. Stas was unimpressed by him, but wanted to keep his wife happy. Nureyev stayed with them in London for seven months, and he and Lee would walk the streets window shopping after his performances. Nureyev claimed years later that he had gotten Lee pregnant, and what do you think she did? She destroyed my baby, he said. Lee refuted his claims, saying he was simply depressed that he would die without an heir. Lee was 27 when Jackie moved into the White House. Lee was not able to attend the inauguration in January 1961, as Lee was still recovering from the birth of Anna, and Jackie herself was still recovering from the birth of John Jr., who had been born on November 25, 1960. In March, Lee finally came to visit, and in the two and a half years of Jackie in the White House, Jackie and Lee grew closer, as Jackie knew Lee was someone she could confide in. 
Jackie would hold cultural gatherings with Tennessee Williams and William Faulkner. Jackie was aware of Jack's affairs, and she would be in charge of the seating arrangements at White House parties, always choosing attractive single ladies to sit next to John, a friend said. She was in charge of choosing Jack's paramours. It was very French. Jack had been having health problems for years, especially with his back. Due to injuries sustained in World War II, he was being treated by the notorious doctor Max Jacobson, who had been introduced to Jack by Stas. Jacobson, known as Dr. Feelgood, administered shots he concocted in his lab that turned his fingernails black. He called the elixir Miracle Tissue Regenerator. It was amphetamines, human placenta, bone marrow, steroids, animal hormones, enzymes, and painkillers. His injections gave his patients jolts of energy. The downside was it could lead to addiction and psychosis. When Bobby Kennedy suggested to analyze the injections, Kennedy said, I don't care if it's horse piss, it works. Some of his other patients were Lauren Bacall, Ingrid Bergman, Truman Capote, Humphrey Bogart, Leonard Bernstein, Marilyn Monroe, Judy Garland, and Elvis Presley. Of these many developed addictions and had struggles with prescription drug abuse. In 1968, he attracted the attention of federal authorities for amphetamine misuse and was stripped of his medical license. Jackie was a great help to John as president, accompanying him to Paris where she charmed de Gaulle speaking French with him for two hours over lunch. De Gaulle leaned over to Jack and said, Jackie knew more about French history than most French do. After the visit, both Jackie and John wrote letters to the French president. He quickly responded to Jackie while John's letter went unanswered. The French press fawned over Jackie, whereas Lee, who accompanied her on the trip, was barely noticed. Jackie had added elegance to his presidency. Lee felt overwhelmed, overlooked, and underappreciated. Jackie was less successful in trying to charm Nikita Khrushchev. She tried to talk about Ukrainian history, but he spoke only of Ukraine's success under communism. So she asked about one of the Soviet dogs that was sent into space that had had puppies before launch. Nine months later, one of the puppies arrived at the White House to the great surprise of Jackie and John. During the trip to London, Jackie, John, Stas, and Lee were all invited to Buckingham Palace. It caused a bit of a stir in the British press as Lee and Stas were invited as Prince and Princess Radziwill, a title he was meant to have given up after becoming a British citizen. Lee felt slighted during the dinner as Prince Philip leaned over to her and said, you're just like me, you must always walk three steps behind. The world fell in love with Jackie and she was dubbed the first lady of fashion by Time Magazine. Women around the world began to copy her look. In an incident that would become important later on, in November 1961, the Kennedys gave a party at the White House in honor of Lee and for the Italian industrialist Giovanni Agnelli and his wife. The party was ruckus. They danced the twist that evening. Champagne glasses overflowed and they partied till 4 a.m. Lyndon Johnson got so drunk he fell on the floor. Gore Vidal sidled up to Jackie and steadied himself, resting his arm on her back. Bobby Kennedy rushed in and pulled Gore's arm away. Bobby and Gore got into an argument, where Gore called Bobby a son of a bitch, then went over to Jack telling him he wanted to wring his brother's neck. Vidal was then escorted home and never invited back to the White House. As First Lady, she was able to use her eye of decor and style to update and redecorate the White House, and she raised the funds to restore the White House to its original glory. She used photographs and records Mary Todd Lincoln, who had been penniless after Lincoln's death, had sold the furnishings to raise money. Jackie tried to buy back the original items, and when not available, had replicas made. She even used wallpaper in the Lincoln bedroom from the Peterson house, the place where Lincoln had been taken after he was shot and later died. All of that is present in her celebrated White House tour, where she led the public through the rooms, commenting on the history of the items. When it was aired on Valentine's Day, 45 million Americans tuned in. Though she appeared calm on camera, she always had a cigarette off to the side, smoking between takes and getting ash on the carpets. Most were impressed with the First Lady's erudition and demeanor, except for Norman Mailer who claimed that Jackie was a phony. In 1962, 
the two sisters took a tour of India together, stopping off in Rome briefly where Jackie had a private audience with the Pope. She wanted to intercede on Lee's behalf and ask for an annulment of Lee's first marriage to Michael Canfield. Lee had petitioned the Vatican a year earlier, but the Pope had refused to intervene. After the meeting with Jackie, where she and the Pope communicated in French, the church agreed to grant it. In India, they called Jackie Amira Kairani, American Queen, as Lee looked stunning walking just behind. Jackie and Lee even tried to teach the twist to the Maharaja. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Jackie refused to be sent away. If anything happens, I want us all here with you, she said. Even if there is not room in the bomb shelter, I just want to be on the lawn when it happens. I just want to be with you and die with you rather than live without you and the children do too. About this time, Lee began her affair with the Greek shipping magnate Aristotle Onassis, one of the richest men in the world. Onassis, who was 27 years older than Lee, was still very much involved with Maria Callas. Callas later recalled, I never disliked Jackie, but I hated Lee. I hate her. I can't help it. I hate her. John and Bobby Kennedy long disliked Onassis and tried to lure Lee away from him. Bobby asked her to go on a trip to Berlin with the president. Jackie was seven months pregnant at the time. Lee stood near the president as he gave his now famous Berlin Wall speech. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words Ich bin ein Berliner. It was the most thrilling experience of my life, Lee recalled later. Stas claimed that during this period, Lee also began an affair with Jack. On August 9, 1963, Jackie gave birth to Patrick, who died a few hours later. Lee immediately flew to Boston to be with Jackie. Jackie was in a deep depression and Lee urged Onassis to invite her on a trip around Greece on his yacht. Kennedy didn't want her to go, but Jackie couldn't face returning to Washington so soon. Jack begged her not to go, finally agreeing on the condition that she persuade Lee not to marry Onassis for the sake of the family. Onassis was a gracious host. He gave them a guided tour of Greece and Turkey. Photographs of Jackie and Onassis began appearing walking arm in arm photos that alarmed both Jack and Maria Callas. At the end of the cruise, Lee received three diamond-studded bracelets, but he gave Jackie a diamond and ruby necklace estimated at $50,000. Lee was miffed. She wrote to her brother-in-law that Jackie's rubies outshined her dinky little bracelets. When Jackie returned, she agreed to help Jack campaign for re-election which included his upcoming trip to Dallas on November 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Many people advised Jack Kennedy not to visit Dallas in his attempt to shore up Southern support. Right-wing conspiracy groups were flourishing there. The night before the assassination, Jack asked her not to stay the night as he had an early meeting. She asked him which outfit she should wear, and he chose the one now immortalized. Jackie recalls their long goodnight embrace. In the morning, he asked her to remove her oversized sunglasses. You're the one they have come to see, he said. She also remembers after the first shot rang out, Kennedy slumped to her side. He had been shot in the shoulder. Later, the doctor speculated that had Kennedy not been wearing his back brace, he might not have remained upright and thus a vulnerable target for the second fatal gunshot to the head. Jackie did not remember crawling to the rear of the car in her pink blood-soaked suit she used the suit jacket of the Secret Service agent to wrap John's head. She also struggled with the Secret Service agent outside the hospital as they placed Kennedy's body on a stretcher. I'm not going to let him go. Mr. Hill, you know he is dead. Let me alone. When the doctor refused to let her see her husband in his coffin before it was closed, she said, Do you think seeing the coffin can upset me? His blood is all over me. How can I see anything worse than I've seen? She took off her wedding ring to place it in the coffin next to her husband. LBJ and aides asked her to change out of her bloody suit on board Air Force One again. She refused, saying, let them see what they've done. Jackie organized the funeral and modeled the procession after Abraham Lincoln's with a horse-drawn casket that wound its way through the city, a riderless horse accompanying the casket. 
Jackie refused to ride in the government-issued Cadillac. She chose to walk behind the casket, leading a delegation from 92 nations. Many aides tried to dissuade her, but Lee advised her to do it. By coincidence, the name of the riderless horse accompanying the casket was Black Jack, the very same nickname her father had. Before departing for Washington, Lee had called Onassis, inviting him to the funeral and that he could stay at the White House, one of only six people invited to do that. Some speculated Lee extended the invitation out of gratitude for restoring Jackie after the death of Patrick. Others that by inviting Onassis, she might rekindle his interest in her. Truman Capote, who was a friend of Lee, said the invitation had actually been Jackie's idea. She knew she could not invite the Greek herself, but by having Lee include him, he automatically got one of the family's invitations. Lee was deeply in love with him, but she played right into Jackie's hands. My sister showed so much courage, but it was the courage of a great actress, Lee said later. One night, Lee crept into Jackie's bedroom and left a note on her pillow, addressed to Jax from Peaks. It read, Good night, my darling Jax, the bravest and noblest of all. And for a brief time, they were again the closest of friends. Eleven days later, Jackie, accompanied by Lee, moved into a place in Georgetown. She spent days in her bed, weeping, asking, why did Jack have to die so young? Jackie told Lee, at night when I'm alone, I just drown my sorrows in vodka. Lee stayed by her side for the entire winter. Lee later told a friend, Cecil Beaton, that she was going through hell trying to help her sister. She can't sleep at night. All she does is weep. She can't stop thinking about herself and feeling sorry for herself. Lee challenged her to get on with her life, and Jackie responded by slapping her sister across the face. Lee told Cecil Beaton, she is so jealous of me. I don't know if it's because I have Stas and the children and have gone my own way and become independent to the extent to that I yell at her and say, thank God, I've broken away from our parents and you and everything from our former life. With Jackie now withdrawing from public life, it was Lee's time to shine. The White House years were so empty, so jet set, said Lee years later. I never liked living in a fishbowl. After the death of my brother-in-law, I was finally free. Lee began writing articles on fashion for Ladies Home Journal and McCall's and began her great friendship with Truman Capote. She doesn't want to just be somebody's sister. She wants to have a life of her own. She is extraordinary. She has a first-class mind. It just has to get released, he said. Lee called Truman her closest friend. I trust him implicitly. He is the most loyal friend I have ever had and the best company. We are so close it is like an echo. We never even have to finish sentences. I feel like he is my brother, only closer. At the time he wrote to his friend, had lunch with Princess Lee, my God. How jealous she is of Jackie. I never knew. I understand her marriage is all but finished. Lee was one of the stars of Truman's black and white ball and Truman left with her at 5 a.m. to have breakfast on Fifth Avenue. The one notable who did not attend the party was Jackie Kennedy. She had been invited and had even bought a mask for the event. But Bobby Kennedy, now a senator from New York and nursing presidential aspirations, had asked her not to attend. He felt it would be inappropriate if she were out dancing while men were dying in Vietnam, so Jackie stayed home. Truman wanted to help Lee outshine Jackie and believed she should be a movie star and got her the lead role in a theater production of The Philadelphia Story. Lee was hesitant, but at Truman's urging, she took to the stage. The play opened for a four-week run in Chicago. I was frozen with fear, said Lee. She found it hard to express emotion, being taught since childhood to repress them. The audience loved it and gave her a standing ovation, but critics were less kind one saying, Lee lays golden egg. Lee believed the critics simply wanted to see her fail and had written their pieces before even seeing the play. Another disappointment was an empty seat in the third row, a seat she had reserved for Jackie. Jackie sent a note wishing her good luck, but didn't attend any performances during the four-week run. She then starred in a movie of the week, playing the title character Laura, where Capote himself wrote the adaptation. The movie received low ratings and the critics were unkind, with the New York Times Magazine saying she was a stunning clothes horse, only slightly less animated than a portrait. 
She was offered small roles in other films, but she refused, saying that her husband threatened not to let her see the children if she kept acting. On June 5, 1968, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated just after winning the California primary in his bid for the presidency. At this time, Jackie was already involved with Onassis. They had taken a cruise around the Virgin Islands several weeks before, and he had asked her to marry him. She had discussed it with Bobby, and he asked her to at least wait till the presidential election was over, till she made a decision. After Bobby's death, she agreed, saying, if they are killing Kennedys, then my children are targets. Lee found out about the nuptials from the newspaper. Ted Kennedy negotiated a prenuptial agreement with Jackie, getting a $30,000 a month allowance, $1 million at his death, and he would provide for all her expenses during the marriage. Just before the wedding, Onassis called his longtime love, Maria Callas, on the phone and asked her to come to Athens, saying, if you come, then Mrs. Kennedy will get angry and leave. Callas angrily said, you got yourself into this, you get yourself out, and slammed down the phone. Lee was also heartbroken, as Truman told a friend. She is crying her eyes out. She is crying and weeping and sobbing. How could she do this to me? How could she do this to me? However, publicly she said, I am very happy to have been at the origin of this marriage, and I am sure it will bring my sister the happiness she deserves. Lee became convinced that Aristotle had only pursued her to get to Jackie, and again felt slighted. Shortly after the wedding, Lee entered a clinic for insomnia and anorexia. In the early months of their marriage, the couple seemed happy, and Lee and Stas would visit them on Scorpio's Onassis's private island. Jackie also invited Peter Beard, a well-known photographer and Yale graduate. Lee compared him to a mix between Lord Byron and Tarzan. He was five years younger than Lee, and soon they began an affair, with Lee leaving her room with Stas at night to meet him, and Jackie providing an alibi. He opened up so many windows for me, he changed my life, because he taught me to be so curious, said Lee of Peter. She even went on safari with him and invited him to stay at their London home. Stas, desperate to keep Lee, agreed. Early into the marriage, Ari and Jackie began having problems. He resented the amount of time she spent in Manhattan. She felt an obligation to Jack to raise their children as Americans and kept them in their New York schools. In addition, he found fault with Jackie's extravagant spending. She spent $1.5 million on couture during their first year of marriage. At one point when seeing a bill for a $9,000 Valentino dress she bought, he said, what does she do with all the clothes? I never see her in anything but blue jeans. What he didn't know was that Jackie would only wear her clothes one or two times and then sell them to consignment shops as a way to earn extra money. In addition, Onassis's luck in business began to desert him. He started to suffer huge losses in his shipping fleet. Several projects he had been working on for years collapsed, and on July 22, 1970, one of his Olympic airline flights was hijacked. He was also still seeing Maria Callas, and had been since a week after the wedding. She refused to sleep with him, but maintained an intimate friendship. He told her that she was the only woman he had ever loved and that he was miserable with Jackie. Back in New York, Lee wrote a piece about her childhood for Ladies Home Journal, and Truman tried to convince her to write a full memoir. The article was a success, but an entire book seemed daunting, and Lee would put off the project for many years. In 1972, Lee joined Truman on tour with the Rolling Stones. Truman was missing deadlines on his book and suffering from writer's block brought on by his alcoholism and drug use. Lee herself felt an air of excitement around the band, but Truman was unimpressed. The band would tease and terrorize him. Truman thought the music was too loud and wore earplugs at the concerts. Keith Richards said, we had a bit of sport with Princess Radish and Truman. He said something bitchy, and I decided I was gonna teach this motherfucker a lesson. Truman never finished the article, saying there was simply nothing to write about. I just can't be bothered. As Onassis was beginning divorce proceedings with Jackie, his son Alexander crashed a plane and died a short time later. Jackie, who had already lost two children and a husband, remained stoic throughout. After his son's death, Onassis aged rapidly, 
walking by himself for hours, shouting at Jackie and blaming her for his misfortunes. His only consolation was Maria Callas. As early in their affair they had lost an infant son, he wept in her arms saying, my boy is gone, there is nothing left for me. He called Jackie superficial, that Callas was a real artist and constantly berated her for her spending. Jackie said years later that Onassis lost his mind after his son's death and became a horror to live with. Lee had also decided to finally divorce Stas. It was just stale for so long, she told Life magazine. Before Jackie's divorce with Onassis could be finalized, he was rushed to the hospital. The one item he brought with him was a red blanket given to him by Maria Callas. Jackie knew he was sick, but was in New York at the time and did not return. Maria Callas remained at his bedside and kissed him, saying, goodbye, my love. He died on March 15, 1975. Jackie said, Aristotle Onassis rescued me at a moment when my life was engulfed by shadows. He meant a lot to me. He brought me into a world where one could find both happiness and love. His daughter, Christina, who blamed Jackie for all the family's bad luck and referred to her as the Black Widow. I hate her, she would tell friends. Jackie and Christina fought over the will. Jackie no longer wanted the prenuptial agreement. In the end, Christina offered Jackie a $20 million settlement and an additional $6 million to cover taxes. Jackie returned to Manhattan to live full time. Lee had decided to get into television. She would have a half hour interview show of her own. She conducted interviews with Nureyev, Steinbeck, and Peter Benchley, among others. Bill Paley, the head of CBS, decided to give her a six episode run. Most guests were pleased and they felt Lee was thoroughly prepared and asked poignant questions. However, the ratings were poor and the show was canceled. Critics claimed she was too polite and Lee blamed the executives for not putting her shows out in a timely manner and for truncating the interviews. But Lee found another way to shine. In 1974, the memoir One Special Summer was published. On a visit to Janet, they found the scrapbook they had made of their first trip to Europe in 1952. It was a testament to how close they had once been. After much persuading, Jackie, who was always shy about publicity, finally agreed. The book became extremely popular. The publication rekindled in Jackie the idea of work, and she took a job at Viking Publishing. What has been said of women of my generation is, they weren't supposed to work if they had families. What are women supposed to do when the children are grown, watch the rain, leave their fine minds unexercised? Of course, they should work if they want to, she said. After two years at Viking, they published a suspense novel by Jeffrey Archer titled, Shall We Call the President? The story was about a fictional account of an attempted murder of Ted Kennedy, and there was a veiled reference to Jackie in the book. She wanted no association with the novel and left to work at Doubleday, where she stayed for 16 years. Though the two sisters lived close to each other, they rarely communicated. Lee, according to Truman, was outraged by Jackie going back to work and decided to open up an interior design firm. The firm was very successful for a time, and one of her designs was featured in House and Garden. Because of her name, many didn't take her seriously, but an editor at Architectural Digest said, had she not been Princess Lee, she would have been known as one of the world's great designers. At the time, she told Time magazine, I am nobody's kid sister. In the summer of 1976, Stas died, and upon his death, she found out, he owed close to 15 million pounds. Lee was disgusted with him. Lee was now in a difficult financial situation and had to sell her apartment and many of her prized possessions. She turned to alcohol, and after several fights, her daughter Anna went to live with Aunt Jackie, much to Lee's annoyance. With Jackie's help, Lee entered Alcoholics Anonymous. Lee spoke how she had always felt second best in her family, and alcohol helped her overcome her shyness and sadness at not having achieved the things she wanted in life. At the end of the first year, Lee achieved sobriety and met Newton Cope, a widower and property owner. In 1979, they got engaged, but on the day of the wedding, Cope called it off. He had received a call from Jackie who wanted to be sure her sister would be taken care of, asking Cope to sign a prenuptial agreement to pay Lee $15,000 a month. Her friends believed Jackie did this on her own without Lee's asking, but regardless, Cope was humiliated. 
I am not buying a cow or a wife like Onassis did, he said. And though Lee agreed to be married in a small ceremony with no prenuptials, he still felt he had been conned and broke off the relationship. Lee was no longer able to own an apartment and was forced to rent, whereas Jackie was worth $150 million. Lee's friend Truman's career had been in a tailspin since publishing La Cote Basque 1965, where he told the sordid secrets of his swans. All literature is gossip. What on earth is Madame Bovary, if not gossip, he told Playboy magazine. Lee stuck by Truman as she was portrayed beautifully in the story, but their friendship broke when Gore Vidal took a lawsuit for slander against Truman. Truman recounted to a magazine the incident at the White House many years ago when a drunken Gore Vidal had insulted Jackie and was thrown out by Bobby Kennedy. Vidal demanded a public apology and a million dollars. The story was true, and it was Lee who had told Truman, but when he asked her through a mutual friend to intervene, she said, oh Liz, what does it matter? They are just a couple of fags. Truman was crushed. Lee stopped taking his calls. She claimed the reason was because of his drinking. He was really pitiful. He really wanted to kill himself. A slow and painful suicide, she said. Some argue that the real reason Lee refused to sign an affidavit for Truman was she would have then been a co-defendant in the case, and her affair with John Kennedy would have then come out at the trial. In 1983, she gave up her design business. She had become tired of dealing with the boring details of running a business. She took a job as a special director of events for Giorgio Armani, which meant she would publicize his clothes by wearing them at special events. On September 24, 1988, Lee married Herb Ross, a successful Hollywood director. Jackie confided to a friend, I'm happy for Lee, because between you and me, Lee has stared into the jaws of hell. Their mother Janet was now quite ill and sold her townhouse for $650,000, which she put in a trust for Lee. Jackie was furious at her mother, asking why it was not split evenly. Her mother replied, Lee needs the money, you don't. Jackie felt it was again her mother playing favorites. In the winter of 1993, Jackie fell from a horse and suffered an infection. The following month while on holiday, she fell ill and was flown to New York. The diagnosis was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. During her illness, she continued to work at Doubleday and wore a turban to cover up her hair loss from the chemotherapy. However, her health faded and she was taken home to live out her final days. In May 1994, Lee rushed to Jackie's apartment. As John told her, Jackie only had hours to live. When Lee arrived, she didn't care about the past. She only wanted her older sister to pull through, the girl she had looked up to so much. On May 19th, Jackie died. Lee was not invited to speak at the funeral. Caroline felt that Lee had not been there for her mother during her illness. I don't do death well, she said many years later. And the prospect of losing my sister was too much to endure, so I stayed away. Jackie was buried next to John in Arlington National Ceremony, beside their children, Arabella and Patrick. Jackie's funeral would leave Lee bitter, seeing how deep the rift between them had become this was exacerbated by the reading of the will, leaving her nothing, not a piece of jewelry, not a trinket, not their father's writing desk. But for Lee, the tragedies were not finished. Five years later, her nephew John would die in a plane crash, and just three short weeks later, her own son Anthony died of cancer. Her marriage to Herb Ross would also have an unhappy ending. At a screening of Steel Magnolias, her husband's latest film, she refused to sit in the second row with the spouses and family, and instead took her seat in the first row with the cast. When Julia Roberts came to take her seat, Lee simply ignored her. And when the staff from Columbia Pictures told her that she had to move, she simply refused. Greatly embarrassing her husband and hurting his career as he refused to stand up to her. Their divorce was bitter, and he died before the process could be completed. Lee herself, Ever the survivor passed away in 2019. The tragedies and successes that befell their lives pulled them apart. One the favorite of their mother, the other their father. One the darling of the American public, the other a princess who had to walk three steps behind. But to go back and read their book, One Special Summer, we see the friendship of the sisters and how close they were. A snapshot in time where their whole lives lay before them 
and in that we can see the beauty and love between two girls who became two amazing women whom time will never forget. As Lee herself said, we will always be sisters, but we were friends once too. I hope you enjoyed the story. If there is anything you would like to add, please do so in the comments. I love hearing from you. And as always, thanks for watching and see you next Friday.